So do you want to learn how to prevent disease in your lawn, AKA fungus? Well, stick around because today we're going to get into it. What's going on folks? Welcome back to the Launch Our Channel. So I know you guys are probably sick of talking about fungus. I know I am. However, there are a few things that I have learned about fungus over the last year and especially at the beginning of this year. At the beginning of the lawn season, I made a very concerted effort to make sure that I did whatever I could from a preventative standpoint to control disease in my lawn. And I went to the store and I bought the ZZX, which is a Scotts product. And quite frankly, I didn't have a lot of success with controlling the fungus that I had in my lawn. And the big question is, was Disease X the problem or was it something else? So I'll give you a spoiler alert and let you know that Disease X was not the problem. So as we go through this video today, I wanna to go through and answer a few key questions that I think are really important in helping to understand how to prevent disease in your lawn. So the first question I wanna answer is, when is my lawn most susceptible to fungus? And the short answer is, it depends. So if you have warm season grasses like I do up in the front of my yard, which is the Bermuda or St. Augustine, typically the time that your lawn is most susceptible is when things are starting to cool off in the fall. Um, it could also be early on in the spring before it really starts moving. And that's because when the grass is growing less, it just makes it a lot more susceptible. When it comes to the cool season grasses, it's just the opposite. When things are starting to warm up, especially in the mid to late spring, and we start to get a lot more moisture in the air, we get a lot more rain, that's probably the worst time for cool season grasses like your perennial ryegrass or your fescue, which is the majority of what I have in my backyard. Now my backyard has a couple of different issues that actually exacerbate the problem. Number one, I've got that big hill, and so I get a lot of moisture that runs down that hill, which ends up keeping things pretty wet. I fixed most of that with that little retaining wall that I put in some drainage, and that seems to have really dry things up, and that helps it quite a bit, especially right here behind my garage. The other thing that my backyard has is quite a bit of shade from all the trees, which also keeps the sun from beating down on the grass and drying it out. Now with the cool season grasses, you don't want to have excessive heat, so I do like the trees back there, but unfortunately because of all those trees, it also keeps it quite wet, which also contributes to my susceptibility to fungus in my backyard. So the next question we want to answer is, when's the best time for us to use a fungicide? Well, that also depends. And it depends on whether we're talking about curative or preventative. So curative meaning I've got an active fungus problem in my yard right now and I need to figure out how to deal with it and get rid of the fungus as fast as possible. And preventative is I'm trying to prevent the fungus from actually coming into my lawn to begin with. Well, one of the problems that I had this year was that I went through and I got the Disease X from Home Depot, which there's nothing wrong with Disease X. The active ingredient in there is azoxystrobin and it is a very good product and it, and it deals very well with certain diseases. The problem was that it dealt with the disease that I was worried about, which was the brown patch. Unfortunately, it didn't deal with the disease that actually came in, which was the Pythium blight. So because of that, I did, the, I did a good thing and I actually did the preventative for the thing that killed my lawn last year, but I didn't prevent the thing that was gonna kill my lawn this year, which is the reason why we went to the Mephinoxum. And that deals very well with the Pythium blight. So the good news is that we were able to identify the fungus early and we were able to identify what we needed to put in the lawn, but unfortunately we came in a little late, so I did have some damage from that. The other thing that I was really concerned with was obviously the brown patch, but I also worry about dollar spot in my lawn. And that's where, at the beginning of the video, when I said that the warm season grass is most susceptible when it's cool, it's a little bit of a misnomer because my lawn, the Bermuda up front, is actually susceptible to dollar spot later on in the summer months, usually around August. So the product that we would want to use there would be something like the azoxystrobin, which is the Disease X, or Heritage G, which is what we're going to apply today, or we would use the propiconazole, which also um, takes care of both of those. So with that in mind, we want to talk a little bit right now about fungicide resistance. So one of the things that we have to be very, very careful with when it comes to fungicides is that your disease that's in your lawn can become resistant to it, especially brown patch. Brown patch will build up a resistance to the exosystrobin or to the propiconazole if that's all you're using. So you wanna mix those up. And the thing we wanna keep in mind is that when it comes to fungicides, there are multiple different types of groups. And what you're doing is you're making sure that you don't use the exact same group every single time. So for instance, exosystrobin is a group 11 product. 
propoconazole is a group three product. The mefenoxam is actually a group four product. So as long as we're interchanging those things and we're making sure that we're using different groups at different times, it not only helps us to attack all the different kinds of fungus that could be in our lawn, it also prevents fungicide resistance from those diseases. So why is it important to understand all of these different groups? So the groups can be a little bit confusing is because there is a committee out there that actually goes through the process of identifying these different groups. And it's based off of when the fungicide manufacturer actually came out with the product. So these groups that the fungicide belongs to are actually identified as FRAC groups. So FRAC is an acronym for the Fungicidal Resistance Action Committee. And they're the ones that actually come up with these codes. So I'm gonna to read to you what it actually is and, and uh, hopefully this clarifies a little bit of what, why these are important. So an international consortium of fungicide manufacturers that provides information regarding fungicide resistance mitigation. The organization has created a code useful for easy classification of fungicides based on their cross resistance behavior. So the thing that we have to remember about this is that they're they created these groups to make sure that we have multiple ways of attacking the fungicide without creating this resistance in the fungus itself or in the disease itself. So the best way to think about this is when we talk about antibiotics that humans would take. So um, we've all heard about antibiotic resistance in the body. Doctors will typically not continue to give you the exact same antibiotic all the time because the disease in our body will then become resistant to those drugs. And so the same thing applies here. We, won't, we don't want to apply the exact same drug to the exact same fungicide over and over and over because there will be resistance. Brown patch is a great example because if we continue to attack the brown patch with nothing but azoxystrobin, eventually that azoxystrobin will cease to be effective in the prevention of that fungicide, which is the reason why we want to mix it with group three products, which is the propoconazole. Propoconazole pretty much does the same thing. It'll attack both the dollar spot brown patch are the two main ones that I worry about and they will attack it from different angles which means that it'll it'll prevent the fungus from creating that resistance to the products so as far as my lawn is concerned I've already done his and I did that a few weeks ago um, it's probably been about a month and a half uh, for the disease X which is the Scotch product which has his astrobin in it it was very effective in preventing brown patch now the problem with the product is and it's not a, a Scotts product issue or a disease X issue is the fact that his astrobin is only effective for about four to six weeks and we're beyond that. So that's the reason why we're going to be using Heritage G, which also has a zosiostrobin in it, and we're going to put that into play today. So one of the things that we did do was we used propoconazole, which is group three. I did see a little bit of brown patch that was starting to pop up, and I was able to take care of things pretty quickly. And then a zosiostrobin is going to come in behind it and attack it from a different angle, and it's also going to last a lot longer because it'll last about four to six weeks. So I hope all that makes sense. We use the mefenoxum to take care of pythium blight. That's a group four product and it doesn't take care of any of the other issues that we had and so that's why we're attacking it from a from a different angle now the mistake that i made was that i thought i was going to use disease x i was going to take care of everything from a preventative maintenance um, standpoint and i wouldn't have to worry about it anymore and unfortunately that was my naive mind thinking that i could do a one-shot deal and just be done with it and unfortunately that's just not the way it works so one of the things that i would suggest going forward not just for me but for everybody is that you put yourself on a cycle where you're providing these products at a pretty regular interval just to be preventative about your disease control. So mefenoxum is going to be great for the pythium blight. So I'm going to be doing that probably every six to eight weeks. Uh, propconazole, again, it's good for about two weeks. So is the mefenoxum. They're both good for about two weeks. And then I'll come in behind it and put in the azoxystrobin, which lasts a lot longer when it comes to the brown patch and the dollar spot. But we'll just be putting ourselves in that regular cycle. And then hopefully that's going to take care of all the issues that we have in my lawn. Now, that's a lot of information. And I wanted to just make sure that I touched on each one of those aspects of fungicides. It's super confusing. It is very difficult to control disease in your lawn. When I had nothing but Bermuda in my old house, it was a lot easier to deal with because I honestly didn't have a lot of disease. Bermuda is super easy. It grows so fast that as long as it's in a very rigorous growth cycle, meaning you're, it's, it's in the middle of growth season, you're putting tons of nitrogen into your lawn, it's pretty much 
growing all of that fungus out faster than the fungus can actually attack the plant, with the exception of the dollar spot. That one I did have to deal with on a pretty regular basis. But outside of that, I really didn't have a lot of disease issues. When I moved to this house where I have lots of trees, I've got lots of, of uh, shade and lots of moisture that pretty much accumulates around the yard, I started dealing with a lot more fungus issues that I pretty much have never had to do before. So I think I learned a couple things this year. I'm going to attack things from a very different perspective and I'm also going to be a lot more preventative about how I deal with things. And so I just wanted to share that with you. Now for today, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply this Heritage G. So it's not just a preventative product, it is also a very good curative product. So last year when I had brown patch, it wasn't until I got this down on my lawn that I was able to really take care of all the brown patch issues. Um, and turns out that I also had some Pythium blight. Now that I look back on some of those old videos, I was able to tell that I had a bunch of things going on that I wasn't dealing with. So now that I've learned a few things, I want to make sure that I pass that information on to you guys. I hope this is really informative for you. So for today, let's get this stuff down. This is an actual granular product, so we'll be using this in my spreader. Uh, all of these products need to be watered in. None of the products on the liquid side need to use any kind of surfactant, so you can just go ahead and put everything in uh, into the lawn, but you do want to go ahead and make sure that you water all of this stuff in. Now, the good news for me is that tomorrow it's supposed to rain, uh, but I'm not gonna trust it because the last time I said that it didn't rain. So as soon as I put this stuff down, I'm gonna turn on my sprinklers and I'm gonna get this stuff watered in, and then tomorrow if it rains, it's fine. Um, the other thing too is, you know, I'm always worried about moisture now, especially now that I know that I have to deal with fungus issues in my lawn. But the one thing that I know for sure is that after tomorrow when it's supposed to rain, it's supposed to be pretty dry after that. So things will dry out. But again, it's one of those things that with Bermuda, I never had to deal with it. You know, I just put in nitrogen in the lawn, made sure that it was watered, and that was pretty much it for the season. Here, I have to worry about like how much water am I putting in? What's going on with, with the water situation and the moisture issue? Is it getting too hot? All those different things. So. Just something new that I have to deal with. It's something new that I have to be aware of. I have to be a lot more strategic about how I handle fungus issues in this lawn. So with that, let's get to putting this stuff down. All right, so one of the things that we do want to talk about is safety. And with all products, you want to make sure that you use gloves, especially any kind of a thing that ends with sides, like herbicides or fungicides and the thing that you want to make sure is that you cover up really well the good news is that the exhaustive strobin that's in this product right here i looked it up and while you have to be careful it is a low toxicity product now i know that some people have commented in videos in the past and have uh like to beat up on me a little bit about my lack of, of a PPE equipment, and uh, they're not wrong, but I am gonna wear gloves. I wanna make sure I don't get this stuff in, uh, into touching my skin. Um, and because it's on a spreader, um, I should probably put on long pants. Um, in fact, I am going to do that as soon as I get done putting this stuff in here. Um, and then I will change my shoes because these shoes that you guys always see me wearing um, are mesh shoes, and so I do get a lot of uh, product inside of those shoes and so i want to make sure that i'm not wearing these because i'll get a lot of uh, the stuff in there um, but yeah i mean i would say always wear uh, gloves always wear um, shoes and pants when you're using any of these products so that you don't absorb it through your skin i'm trying to be better about it but you know sometimes i just want to get things done so that's it i'll be back i'm gonna put on some pants and uh we'll get to we'll get to spreading this stuff out
All right, folks, so that's pretty much it for today. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. The two big things that I want you all to remember is that you need to make sure that you mix your code groups so that you prevent the resistance of fungus to the fungicide. The other thing that I want you all to remember is to make sure that you use the right fungicide for the right fungus. So the mistake I was making was that I was using one fungicide to take care of everything when it just was never going to be effective for that. And number two, because I was using the same group, I was actually promoting some fungicide resistance. So with all of that, I hope that's helpful. If you guys have questions about anything that I've said, please comment down below. I'm happy to discuss anything that I've said so far and maybe provide some more clarification. Also, there's a lot of people out there that know a lot more about this stuff than I do. And if you do have something to add, please comment down below. I would love to hear your opinion. I would love to hear your insights. And then maybe all of us can learn something together. So with that, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. If you like this video, don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe if I've earned your subscription. And if you wanna be notified of future videos, don't forget to hit that bell and we'll see you on the next one. Have a great week, everybody.